Hi, everybody. This is an extension of uh, what we were talking about. We were talking about 2023 uh, rapture parallels with tribulation parallels. And this is, uh, I don't know what we want to call this, part two or part three uh, of all that. And um, and Samuel was just uh, talking about uh, the 69-week um, parallel, well, prophecy from, from Daniel uh, and Nehemiah. So... Yeah, go ahead, Daniel, and continue. I mean, not Daniel. Daniel <laughs> continue on with what you were saying with. Uh, with oh, system. Daniel and Samuel does rhyme. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So what we uh, just discussed earlier was first this chart, just as a little reminder, and then we discussed this chart. Mm -hmm. But we ended at this chart, right? So we want to start off from here continue where we just uh, stopped. Okay. All right. As I uh, explained in much depth previously, it doesn't make much sense to choose choose 457 BC as the starting point. Because, as we can see, the conclusion of this decree it says nothing about rebuilding Jerusalem. Okay, so now you might be asking yourself, okay, so when did that take place then? When was when was the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the city? Well, I'm glad you asked. That took place in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. That was the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, 444 BC. All right, so what was this issuance about? The emphasis was on the city Jerusalem. Notice that this time the emphasis on the, is on the entire city. Nehemiah desired, desired to be sent to Jerusalem to rebuild the city of the burials of his fathers. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 5. Letters were given to Nehemiah where he was granted timber to construct beams for the gates of the fortress, which was by the temple, and for the city wall, and for the house which he occupied. Now there is a direct reference to the restoration of the city. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 3 and 5, and of the city gates and walls. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 3 and 8. So that already sounds way better in terms of uh, fitting with the prophecy in Daniel 9, 25. So what is the conclusion? The issuance in Nehemiah 2 fits the prophecy in Daniel 9 to a T. The month of Nisan, 444 BC, is where the clock started ticking. Many people mistakenly take the restoration of just the temple as a starting point of the prophecy instead of the restoration of the entire city Jerusalem. We are dealing here with the ancient Near East. If you don't have a wall, you don't have a real city. No wall, no defenses, no defenses, no real city. That's simple. Okay. So now... We finally have the correct starting point, which is 444 BC. And also, that notice this. According to Lee Brainard, Chuck Missler, and Dr. Andy Woods, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem was the conclusion of the 69 weeks, or 483 prophetic years. That's where the 173,880 days ended. Not at the baptism of Christ, like many falsely assume. Uh, you know that there is a very popular teaching, right? That the 16, 69 weeks basically ended at the uh, commencement of Christ's ministry, right? Okay. Or at the, the baptism of Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Because what they do is, is, is this calculation. Oops, it's a big, big... Uh, Okay, what they what they start off is with the wrong starting point, four fifty seven BC. Mm -hmm. And now, notice this: they add four hundred and eighty three, not prophetic years, but solar years. Uh, four hundred and eighty three solar years instead of prophetic years, and then we need to add plus one because there's no such thing as a year zero. Okay, and then that gets us to twenty seven AD. Uh, okay. Right. So that's how people come to the idea that the 69 weeks 
ended at the commencement year of Christ's ministry or at the baptism of yeah, baptism of Christ. But the problem is that this timeline is already wrong to begin with. Mm -hmm. Wrong starting point, yeah. Yeah, wrong starting point and wrong uh, reckoning of years. Mm -hmm. Not solar years, but prophetic years. Mm -hmm. Right? As you can remember from this chart here. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So, so where do the 69 sevens end? The 69 weeks end at Palm Sunday, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem in AD 33. So what does that mean for us? That means that we can actually know the exact year of Christ's crucifixion, right? Because God gives us a math formula in Daniel 9 or a prophetic countdown, if you will, to Palm Sunday. Mm -hmm. and, the, and by the way, there's also this very popular teaching that many um, teach, and that is that Christ's ministry fulfilled, supposedly fulfilled the first half of Daniel's 70th week. Right? Have you heard of that teaching? Yeah, mm -hmm. heard of that, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Many many people believe that Christ's ministry already fulfilled the f first half of Daniel's 70th week. Now, why do they say that? They say that because they choose the wrong starting point. 457 B.C., plus 483 plus one and then now what they do next is they add three and a half years plus three and a half years and then they say oh okay therefore jesus already fulfilled the first half of the 70th week but this is falser than false because we know that from the correct contextual understanding of the timeline the ministry of Christ was in the second half of the 69th week, not in the first half of the 70th week, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Okay, just wanted to make that clear because so many people believe that there are only three and a half years left and not seven years left, right? And the reason because the, re the reason they believe there are three and a half years left instead of seven it's because of this whole issue here, the correct starting point of the 70 weeks prophecy. And you said that his last three and a half years were in the last half of the 69th week. Is that what you said? Correct. Yes. Okay. The, the second half of the 69th week. Yeah. Yeah. That's where his ministry was. His ministry didn't even go into the 70th week because there is a, a large gap of 2000 years between the 69th week and the 70th week. Right, the church age. The church age is the gap time. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, and that just right. brings clarity as to why this uh, this tribulation is seven years and not anything less, or, or you know, so it's the seventieth week of Daniel. So that that's, and then we understand the seventieth week of Daniel is Jacob's trouble, um, which is the, another uh, support and why it's a uh, we're we're going to get raptured before the seven year. Um, Tribulation. Mm, absolutely. So just by using the correct timeline of the 70 weeks, only then do you understand why there still needs to be seven years on the prophetic time clock. Mm -hmm. Okay. But now there is still a different reason why so many people believe that um, Jesus Christ fulfilled the first half of the 70th week. It's because of Daniel 9.27. Okay, And he will enter into a binding and irrevocable covenant with the many for one week, seven years. But in the, min but in the middle of the week, he will stop the sacrifice and grain offering. And on the wing of abominations will come one who makes desolate even until the complete destruction, one that is decreed, is poured out on the one who causes the horror. Now there are exactly two ways how you can, how you can deal with Daniel 9.27. You can either take this literally or completely spiritualize the verse away. Now, what a lot of people do is they just spiritualize the verse away by saying, oh, Jesus 
stop the sacrifice with his crucifixion. And then what they do is they apply Daniel 9.27 to Jesus Christ instead of the Antichrist. Because Daniel 9.27 is about the Antichrist, not Jesus Christ. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now here's the question. Why is Daniel 9.27 about the Antichrist and not Jesus Christ? Well, the simple answer is context. Let's, let's read verse 26. Then after the 62 weeks of years, the anointed one will be cut off and denied his messianic kingdom and have nothing and no one to defend him. And the people of the other prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end will come with a flood. Even to the end, there will be war. Desolations are determined. Now, we all agree that the first half of verse 26 is about Jesus, obviously. Right? The anointed one will be cut off and have nothing. Now, that's obviously talking about Jesus. Yeah. But you have to notice this about verse 26. Verse 26 is not just speaking about Jesus. It's also speaking about the Roman Emperor Titus. Okay, so who is the Roman Emperor Titus? Okay, Titus. Okay, Titus. Okay, Titus Caesar Vespanius. Now, how do I come to this conclusion? Why do I come up with Titus Caesar Vespanius? Because the following, notice this in verse 26. And the people of the other prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Now, here comes the million dollar question. Who destroyed the city and the sanctuary in 70 AD? Titus, right? Or the Romans, basically the Romans did, right? So when it says, and the people of the other prince. So who are the people? First of all, the people are the Romans. Okay. And who is the other prince? That is Titus. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, so notice verse 26, verse 27 is in direct context. With Titus Caesar Vespanius. So the reason why verse 27 is about the Antichrist is because Daniel is making um, what you can call like a fluent um, um, how do you call that? It's like a parallel. Yeah, like a parallel, parallel if you will. Because Titus was a, a Roman emperor. Right, so he's like a type and shadow. There are many types sh of shadows in the book of Daniel. For example, Antiochus Epiphanes. Right, yeah. Antiochus the fourth and uh, Epiphanes is a type and shadow of the Antichrist. Mm -hmm. But Daniel also uses a different type and shadow of, of the Antichrist, and that is Titus. Okay. Right, so we need to study the context. The one who destroyed the city and the sanctuary in 70 AD was uh, Titus and the Romans. That's why verse 27 is about the Antichrist and not Jesus Christ, like many try to teach. All right, cool. I like it. I appreciate that. Doing awesome. Also, to, one more thing to add to Daniel 9.27 is... Uh, then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abomination shall be the one who makes desolate. So Jesus is not in the business of making covenants and breaking them and making abominations. So, you know, that's another point to say that that's not that's the reason why it's uh, the Antichrist and not uh, Jesus. Absolutely, I agree. Why would Jesus break his own covenant? Yeah. Here we have the Daniel 9.27 overview of the tribulation period. It starts off with the covenant, with the peace treaty by the Antichrist. 
Then three and a half years later, the Antichrist desecrates the temple and ends sacrifices. And then three and a half years later, Christ's second coming. So what that means is that we can take Daniel 9.27 literally and not spiritually. All right, cool. All right, let's go back to page two of this chart. All right, so now we know why I choose 444 BC as a starting point. Plus 69 weeks gets us to Nissan 10. All right, Nissan 10 was Christ's triumphal entry into Jerusalem, also known as Palm Sunday. Also, you know, adding to this, uh, you know, when Jesus wept over the city? Yep. Uh, it probably would be fair to say that if they had done this math, the math that you're presenting right now, they could have figured out that that was their Messiah coming. Correct, yes. And they also had the prophecy of uh, uh, when Jesus rides on a donkey. Mm -hmm. So so the, if they had read their Bibles, and, and they could have probably figured it out. And I, I think that there was a handful of people that actually knew, you know, and probably did the math. Uh, but anyway, go ahead. All right. So now here's also something fascinating. What took place exactly seven days after Nissan 10? What happened on Nissan 17? Well, every knows what ha everybody knows what happened there. That was Resurrection Sunday, of course. <laughs> yeah. Resurrection Sunday. Yeah, so between uh, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem and uh, Palm Sunday are seven days. Absolutely, okay. Now, up off to the next date, 40 days later, what happened in IR-26? On IR-26 was the Ascension Day. According to theory, this marks the beginning of the double Harpazo count. 726, 726 days that leads directly to 2023. So just for everyone who doesn't get why 726 is a significant number, well, when you check in the Greek Strongs, 726 means harpazo, to seize, catch up, or to snatch away. That's what 726 means in the Greek uh, Strongs. So you won't find this uh, number like in the Bible or something. It's just a, a Greek Strongs uh, parallel. It's, a, it's more of a fun fact for a lot of us rapture people. We always love to reference 726. But so, uh, so what you're saying is you can use 726, 726 days, and you can add it to any day in 33 AD and and potentially get to a 2023 date. Is that what you're saying? Uh, not to any day in AD 33. Some days in AD 33 uh, would, would land to 2022. Okay. Um, but, but notice here I chose Ascension Day, right? Okay. Ascension Day. And we... When was Ascension Day? We know that Ascension Day, according to Acts chapter 1, verse 3, was exactly 40 days after Resurrection Sunday. Yeah. Well, we have a lot of people with different speculations on that. I'll be honest. Sometimes I scratch my head with this. But uh, but yeah, this is probably the most simplest uh, concept of, of when Ascension Day was. Yeah, 40 days after mm -hmm. uh, when he rose. Yeah. Yeah, just for the sake of simplicity. We're going to just do 40 days after Resurrection Sunday. Yeah. That gets us to Ascension Day. And then 726, 726 days after Ascension Day, AD 2023. All right, cool. So now there are three other historical dates which are worth mentioning. Also, just for fun, take it for what it's worth. And the first one is AD 70. That's the first one I want to mention. What happened in AD 70? The Roman siege of Jerusalem and the destruction of the second temple, also known as Herod's temple. Right? So the city and the sanctuary was destroyed in AD 70. Right? Remember our discussion of uh, Daniel 9.27? Yep. Yeah. The other prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. This prophecy was fulfilled in 70 AD, mm -hmm. right, by the Romans. And this is also the reason why Daniel 9.27 is, uh, 
is about the Antichrist because the Antichrist will be um, the leader of the revived Roman Empire, right? So Daniel Daniel switches to a to a former Roman Empire, uh, to a former a former Roman ruler, to a future Roman ruler, right? All right, let's go back to the chart. Now, here's what's very fascinating. Between AD 70 and 2030 AD, just so happens to be exactly 40 jubilees. 40 jubilees are four times 490 years. Hmm. Again, maybe coincidence, maybe not. Who knows? Yeah, okay, so 40 Jubilee cycles from the destruction of the temple brings us to 2030s. Is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Minus seven years, we got 2023. So yeah, awesome. Absolutely. All right, and the second date worth, worth mentioning is AD 1540. AD 1540, Suleiman the Magnificent decided to rebuild the city walls fully, partly on the remains of the ancient walls. Being built in circa 1537 through 1541, they are the walls that exist today. And notice we can use Suleiman the Magnificent, Magnificent as a parallel for Nehemiah. But this time, instead of adding prophetic years, we add solar years. So 1540 AD plus 490 solar years also gets us to 2030. And 490 solar years are how many jubilees? 10. Mm -hmm. 10 jubilees. Mm -hmm. All right. And by the way, do you remember why the 70 year captivity took exactly 70 years? The the captiv the Babylonian captivity took 70 years, right? Mm -hmm. Remember that? Well, they didn't, they didn't pay for their, uh, they didn't let their land rest for a certain amount of time. Was it 490 years? Absolutely, yes. That's According right. to Second Chronicles uh, 36, verse 21, uh, Israel failed to keep the sabbatical years for 490 years. In other words, they failed to keep 70 sab sabbatical years. And because they failed to keep 70 sabbatical years, the Babylonian captivity lasted 70 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So 490 years back from 2030 gets us to 1540. Okay. Exactly. Cool. And now the third day, which is worth mentioning, is 881882. That was the first Zionist aliyah. Now, what the crack is a first Zionist aliyah? Uh, Zionist aliyah, okay. Aliyah is the immigration of Jews from the diaspora to historically the geographical land of Israel, which is the modern era chiefly represented by the state of Israel. So in other words, to put it simple, an aliyah is a, basically a Jewish migration into Israel. Okay. Okay. And here's the uh, here's the interesting thing. First Zionist Elijah was in eighteen from eighteen eighty two on. In Zionist history, the different waves of Elijah, beginning with the arrival of the uh, Biluim from Russia in eighteen eighty two, are categorized by date and the country of origin of the immigrants. All right. So I found that a very fascinating thing and now 100, 174 years later it gets to 2030 now how long is three jubilees right there it looks like right yep mm -hmm. three jubilees are 147 years okay and also yeah always the following year equals to the jubilee year now what's so special about 147 well when you go to genesis 47 verse 28 Guess who died at age 147? Mm, I don't know who. <laughs> Jacob. 
Uh, uh, Jacob's Jacob, trouble, right? Jacob's trouble. Jacob. None other, none other than Jacob. Lift exactly three jubilees. Mm -hmm. Which I find very interesting. Yeah, really great. Yeah, again, these are these are better parallels than yeah, adding adding a date to your your kid's birthday or something. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I like it. All right, cool. You no, know, we don't know. We're we are just speculating and yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah, as I said at the beginning, at the disclaimers, right? Take yeah. everything with a grain of salt. Yeah, that's right. All just speculation and just for fun. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm right. 147. Yeah. Okay. He, Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years. So the, the length of Jacob's life was 147 years. Okay. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. All right. So we discussed this page, right? In the beginning. Mm hmm. Then we discuss this page. Now, now we can discuss this one if you want. This is basically just a prophecy panorama. Mm -hmm. This is like a, the whole 7,000 year plan, basically. I stole this chart from Dr. Andy Woods. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> he gets the credit for making this chart. First comes, uh, right, the Old Testament. The Old Testament took roughly 4,000 years. Mm -hmm. And after that comes the uh, Messiah's coming and death in uh, 33 AD. And after that is the church age. Now, the church age is a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week, which is the tribulation. And before that comes the rapture, of course. When we take Daniel 9.27 literally and not spiritually, we realize that the tribulation is seven years. And also these seven years are also described in Revelation chapter six through nineteen. And then the tribulation is ended by the second advent of Christ. And then after the second advent of Christ comes the one thousand year millennial kingdom, which is described in Revelation twenty. And after the millennial kingdom comes the great white throne judgment. And after that comes basically just the eternal state, which is uh, described in Revelation 21 through 22. <clears throat> yeah, pretty basic outline. Mm -hmm. I like it. Nice and clean and basic. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So, of course, we already discussed this chart, the Daniel 927 overview of the tribulation period. Also basic stuff. Okay. Now this one is a bit less basic. <laughs> because when we read the book of Revelation. We notice there are seven seals. Right? Seven trumpets. And seven bowls. Now the seven year tribulation. Starts off with the first seal. The first seal is the the advent of the Antichrist. Now, before you go on with this, there are so many different interpretations on seals, trumpets, and bowls, and when they happen. I, I'm I'm going to be honest. I'm I'm trying to look at everything with new eyes every time I read them. So, um, but anyway, go ahead and read uh, and say what you're about to say there, and we'll go with it. Go with the flow. Mm -hmm. All right, and. By the way, I also stole this chart from Dr. Andy Woods. So all the blue starts, are blue, <laughs> everything that's blue, I stole from Dr. Andy Woods. This is Dr. Andy Woods, Andy Woods, Andy Woods, Andy Woods, Andy Woods, Andy Woods, <laughs> Andy Woods, Andy right. Woods, Andy Woods, Andy Woods, <laughs> Andy Woods. All right. So, uh, if you're mad at, at Samuel, you can get mad at Andy Woods if you don't like what he's saying here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> absolutely. All right. <laughs> And yeah, you know what? And again, we're all just brothers and sisters in Christ, just trying to figure this all out. And nobody's got it 100% nailed. And uh, so we have to keep an attitude of uh, learning and relearning and restructuring our thoughts on a lot of these things. But go ahead. And now here's the very fascinating thing about the book of Revelation. When you read the book of Revelation, you notice that there are exactly five non-chronological parenthetical insertions. 
The first non-chronological parenthetical insertion is between uh, seal six and seal number seven. That is Revelation seven, where it describes the 144,000 Jews. Now the second insertion is between trumpet six and trumpet seven. That is Revelation 10 through 11, which is about the uh, two witnesses. The third insertion is uh, Revelation 12 through 14, which describes Israel's flight into the wilderness. Then the fourth insertion is between bowl number six and bowl number seven, which describes Armageddon. And then the fifth and final insertion is talking about Babylon, Revelation 17 and 18. Now, for all those who like patterns, there's al always an insertion between a 6 and a 7, right? There's an insertion here between seal 6 and seal 7, another insertion between trumpet 6 and trumpet 7, and another insertion between bowl 6 and bowl 7. So this becomes much easier to read the book of Revelation with, with that knowledge in your um, back head, basically. Okay. And I know many have a lot of different opinions regarding Babylon. I hold the opinion that Babylon literally means Babylon in Iraq. I know some say that Babylon means the Catholic Church. Some say Babylon means Rome or America or Canada, Switzerland, Australia, the Antarctica. I don't, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> but notice the all the entire geography in Revelation is meant to be understood literally, including yeah. Babylon. Well, you know, so like I said at the beginning, before you started talking, I I don't really want to express my thoughts on a lot of these things right now because I am kind of going back to the drawing board a little bit. I'm just um, I don't know. I'm, I'm I'm reading things. I'm hearing things that are way different than what I've understood about all these things about Babylon, about the timing of when Babylon gets destroyed, who is Babylon, when it gets destroyed. So I'm just kind of spec doing a lot of speculation on that right now. I'm trying to go back and not have a, a closed mind uh, and and just relearn all these things. And even the 144,000 Jews. I mean, this might be a conversation we should have. Um, outside of a video and 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 hash this stuff out but um I, some people think that the, the 144,000 are not even in the trip is again i don't want to uh expand on that right now I, because i'm not i'm i'm more in i don't know land about that i and and who is babylon and when it happens and uh and the timing of the two witnesses and all, all this kind of stuff there's so many different perspectives uh my goodness so uh but anyway yeah so you're of the opinion it's uh actual actually in iraq correct that is my humble opinion yes so i'm expecting uh the city of babylon being built very soon in iraq just next to the euphrates river because notice that uh the sixth angel dries up the euphrates river right so what i find interesting is that everyone takes the euphrates river as the literal geography right Right. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody takes that literally as the actual geography in in a uh, Iraq, but then only six verses later in a uh, Revelation sixteen verse, well, somewhere at the bottom, they suddenly spiritualize Babylon. But here's the thing: Babylon is just right next to the Euphrates River. All right. There's a reason why the angel is drying out the Euphrates River. It's because Babylon is right next to the Euphrates River, right? So when, so when we take the Euphrates River as literal geography, therefore, we can take Babylon as literal geography. This is to stay consistent in biblical interpretation. Okay. All right. That was that chart. Now we can move to the next one. Ah, perfect. Now here we have the 75 day interval. Where do we get the 75 day interval? The 75 day interval is described in Daniel 12, verse 11 through 12. 
Now, we already discussed the 75 day interval here, right? With Abraham's age. It's not a coincidence, I believe, that Abraham just so happened to be 75 years old when he entered the promised land in 2023. All right. How do we get this 75 day interval? Well, it's pretty simple. What we do is this calculation. 1335 minus 1260. 75. There we go. 75. Now, here's the question. What happens during those 75 days, right? After the second coming? Well, here, I should do this. Uh, I got one minute left of this video, so maybe we should end this one and start another video. Yep. Okay. All right. So that's the end of this part, and we'll get back with Samuel in a minute.